Well, good morning. Glad to see this many out. Uh, there's some sickness going around, and those are out of town. Please keep them within your prayers. And we're glad to see some that have been sick and back with us. I was called at 8.30, a little bit past 8.30 this morning, and I seen Marshall's name come up on my cell phone, and I went, oops. <laughs> so I do try to be prepared at all times, but uh, it's nothing like uh, sitting around and getting to really study on your lesson and be prepared. And I'm glad Chuck got some confidence in me, so we'll see what happens here. So, yeah. Did Jesus Christ die in vain? To die is a sad, vain, sad thing to happen. And it's a shame that some die in vain. It's awful tragic. There are those who are out on the highway or being killed by drunk drivers or those who are underneath the influence of drugs. Read yesterday on the news, like down in Oklahoma, as a college was celebrating their homecoming and everybody was happy and, and a joyous occasion and waiting to wait for their football game to start. And as the parade was going on, a woman runs through the crowd with her car, killed several people, and sent quite a few to the hospital. And the bad part about it, and I'm not saying it's not bad for all of them, but an old two-year-old child was killed in that accident likewise. It happens. And it's a shame that it takes place. But I want to ask you a question this morning. Did Jesus Christ die in vain? About 2,000 years ago, Christ died on the outside walls of Jerusalem. We can read about his prophecies of his death in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, and Luke, the 23rd chapter. But if you turn to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and let's read verses 1 through 4. It says, Moreover, brother, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which ye are also saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he arose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. The whole thing is that everything that we believe as Christians or based upon those first four, four verses of chapter 15. That Christ came and lived upon this earth, and lived a perfect life, died upon the cross, and was erected. But a lot of people really take a good bit of the scriptures in vain. And that's why I want to ask you, how are you standing before God at this time? Some have assist, uh, insisted that we are still underneath the law of Moses. And many have insisted throughout the years that Christians are still underneath that old law. And that's something that we need to look at. Galatians, the fourth chapter. If you would please turn with me. Galatians 4. Verse 21. Tell me that you desire to be under the law. Did you not hear the law? And those were the Judaizers at this time in, in the region of Galatia. They were desiring to remain underneath the law. They wanted those Christians to be circumcised before they became a Christian. They were trying to abide to that. Also in Colossians, the second chapter. We can read about those who were in the region of Colossae. 
that were also heretics and were uh, trying to bind the old law. In Colossians, the second chapter, and let's begin at verse 13. It says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphantly over them in it, that no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day, or of a new moon, or of the Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which we have seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have nourishment ministered, and knitted together and increased with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinance? Touch not, taste not, handle not. For all are, for all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship, humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to be the satisfying of the flesh. And we have many denominational friends that believe that the old law is just as valid for us today. But yet, at the same time, they don't believe in the whole old law. Not once have I ever seen them offer up a sacrifice as is commanded within the scriptures. And if we were talking about this morning, about the Passover, how they were to take the firstborn of the flock, of the, of the sheep or of the goat, and they were to sacrifice it to God. See anybody out there that does that? But yet they want to hold on to the whole Ten Commandments. That's God's law. It was a law of Moses. It's been given to us. We need to abide by that. But we got to understand that the law of Moses was annulled, done away with by the death of Christ. In verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it away out of the way, nailing it to his cross. When he died upon the cross, he done away with the old law. He had a new will that was coming in, the New Testament, as you would say. That's why it's divided as the Old Testament and the New. The Old was those that were carried out by those who were proselyte Jews or Jewish people. They were abidance to the law of God, the law of Moses. Would you really like to be underneath the Old Law? Think about it. Think about all the things and they had to abide to. As we read through the book of Ecclesiastic about what's unclean and what's clean and how many days you've got to be separated and then you have to go and get inspected by the priest and then they have to give the okay or they have to put you out of the tribe outside the, the, the tribe of Israel or you might be purified and then you have to offer up so many sacrifices to find yourself clean again. That they could associate with you. Try to remember all those things. I couldn't imagine trying to remember all those details. All the law that was given to them. Is the old law. All the old law, the judicial, the ceremonial, and moral was made invalid by Christ's death. 
And there are two passages that makes that clear. One, the law was written and engraved on stones, passed away. Second Corinthians, the third chapter, and verse 7. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. It's eight in the fact that this thing, the law that God or Moses brought down off of the mount, was soon or later going to pass away. In Romans the seventh chapter, verse six, it says, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Truth about Christ is the fact that Christ came to fulfill the law. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill it. All those prophecies that we can read about underneath the Old Testament has always been fulfilled through Christ. And they knew about the prophecies, but they misunderstood them and were trying to look for that physical kingdom instead of the spiritual kingdom that Christ was going to set up. And Christ was constantly trying to get them to understand that. If we turn to the book of Galatians, and the fourth chapter, and begin at verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, if thou art no more a servant, but a son, if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. How be if then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after ye have known God, or rather have, are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye did desire again to be in bondage? Ye deserve days, months, and times, and years. I am afraid, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. What is that? Christ came down. It was the time that God has designed for his son to come down upon this earth to help make us sons of God. If we become obedient to God's will, we are His children. We are no longer servants. We are part of God's family. And this was what happened when Christ came to redeem us. Galatians, the third chapter, and beginning at verse 20. Not a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For there had been a law given which had not been given life. Verily righteousness shall have been by the law. But the scriptures have concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shot up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, if the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under that schoolmaster. The old law was something that was to guide them. They were to teach them about Christ's coming. We were to learn what God was like. 
He is a strict God, but yet at the same time, a loving God. He is, he is a selfish God at times. It is a schoolmaster. It is something that we need to take and study and learn by how God is. And he came down here because those things underneath the old law could not save these people from their sins. All it did was roll their sins up until the time that Christ died upon that cross. If righteousness is through the law, then Christ died in vain. Galatians 2nd chapter, verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the, through the law, then Christ died in vain. Now, I tried to go through this this morning real quick, so forgive me. <laughs> Many deny the necessity of the church. When I say church, I mean the church in which Christ said he would build in Matthew, the 16th chapter, and verse 18. And I, I still don't understand how people can misread that verse. The fact that there are denominations out there saying he told Peter that he was going to build his church, Peter's church, and that he would be the head of it. Doesn't say that. Christ told Peter, he said, on that statement he just made, I will build my church. Talk about Christ. Not anyone else. But there are a lot of people to say today that it is not necessary to be at church services and they also ridiculed the gospel preachers that were placed upon it. Some say preach Christ and not the church. Well, who did Christ save? Think about it. If you teach Christ, what are you teaching? The only thing I could say according to them is Christ is born. <laughs> That'd be it. He healed a few people, fed 5,000 on one occasion, 3,000 on another. That'd be it. That'd be all I could say. But when you teach Christ, you're talking about his church. When you talk about the teachings of Christ, you're talking about salvation of our soul. And the only way you can be saved is you have to join his church. You gotta be a member of the body of Christ. Some say, well, it's all Christ and not the church. Well, that's like saying it's all the husband and not his pride. Bride. What's that old saying? Behind a good man. It's a good woman. Don't we make that statement at times? Aren't you not exalting both? Aren't you not praising both? Are you not saying something good about both of them? An individual is doing real good and doing the right things on most occasions and every opportunity he has. Who's behind him? Usually a good woman trying to help guide and push and, and help him. Isn't that not true? <coughs> when we talk about Christ, we also talk about his bride, the church, his body. We can turn to the book of Ephesians. It talks about this, and we'll get into that verse here in a little bit. But do you realize that when Christ died, the church of Christ owes its very existence? Because we were purchased with his blood. Acts the 20th chapter, verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourself and to all the flocks which the Holy Spirit had made you overseers to the shepherd of the Christ, church of God, 
which he purchased with his own blood. God purchased the church by dying upon that cross. That's why we respect and observe the Lord's table every Lord's day. We, we pay remembrance. It is a memorial to what Christ done for us to save us from our sins, to give us a, a body, a church that we can attend and learn about God's will and to encourage one another. We are sanctified by his death. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that but she should be holy and without blemish. Christ died for his bride. Would you die for your wife? If it came to that point, will we die for our wives? I'm asking you, you think about it. How much do you love her? How much do you care for her? Christ was willing to die for his bride. Are we willing to do such? Are we willing to die for the church and for Christ? He did for us. We was redeemed when he gave himself. Titus the second chapter beginning in verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. He gave himself. Why? So that we have a blessed hope that we can be saved from our sins and be able to live for eternity that we cannot imagine. We talk about it, we hard to comprehend it. Imagine never having to cry anymore, have any more pain, any more suffering. A lot of us, if we get older and we get arthritis and, and other problems within our health, we, we probably understand that just a little bit better. Wouldn't it be nice to get away from all that? God gave us that, Christ gave us that opportunity. No more sorrow, no more death. No more pain. But he gave it to us because he loved us and died upon that cross. And if we don't believe that and believe that we can do without the church, he died in vain. Truth regarding Christ and his church. Ephesians, uh, the fifth chapter, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, so it's also, Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of that body. Colossians 1.18 He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Colossians 1.24 I have now rejoiced my sufferings for you, and fill up with my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. To talk about Christ, you have to talk about his body. 
You have to talk about his church. You can't separate it. No matter how hard you try, you cannot separate the two. You got about talking about one, and you be talking about the other. Likewise. And we got to get understanding, people to understand that they are doing this and causing Christ to have died in vain. Again, excuse me. <laughs> I tried to go through this real quick this morning. So. Uh, so, we need to understand truth regarding the unity of believers. Paul pleaded for the church and and church of Corinth to be united. And 1 Corinthians, and we all know this verse very well. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, and begin at verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are at the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now I, this I say, that every one of you saith, I am a Paul, I am a Paulus, I am Cephas, and I am Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest that any should say that I baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and words, lest the Christ cross of Christ should be made of none effect. We are to be united. We are to be one as Christians. Paul said in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses uh, four through six, there is one body, one spirit, just as you are called in the hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of, of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Jesus died for the church. If the church in which he died for is really unnecessary, he died in vain. If 400 denominations are right, we can attend just any church, then Christ did not reconcile us into one body, and therefore he died in vain. If I am lost, the Bible teaches that many will be eternally lost. People don't like to hear that. But it talk about a punishment. Matthew 8 and verse 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Luke the 16th chapter, verse 24. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Can you imagine suffering like that? You ever watch one of them old westerns? Anybody ever remember the show called The Rifleman? I know some of us older ones probably do. But him and the sheriff of North Folk uh, was out in the desert with a criminal, and the criminal kept laughing and, and a little crazy, telling that he could outlast them all, and he knew where the water was, and and. He chased all the horses away and they were out of water and, and they were baking in that sun for days. And as the sheriff was an older individual, he was starting to wither underneath him. 
that, that sun. Desperate for water, even to the point where he even thought about letting this man get away. If he just shown where the water was. It's going to be so much worse than we can ever imagine. Eternal damnation, punishment and hell. And that means that we are to be lost means it's an eternal punishment. Matthew 25 and verse 46, and these will go away into everlasting punishment but the righteous into eternal life. Second Thessalonians 1 9, ye shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. Can you imagine that? It's not God's will that we be lost. But the fact is, he'd love for every single one of us to be saved. If we just believe that Christ died for us and carried out his will. Paul made the statement that if he could give his life and it would save all of Israel, he'd be glad and happy to do that. How do we feel about that? Will we feel the same way? Do we feel the same way? When we walk out of the building, do we tell others about Christ and what He done for us? Christ died to save us from that eternal punishment. In John the 12th chapter, in verse 32, and I if am if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. In 1 Peter, the second chapter, and verse 24, or 24, excuse me, who himself bore our sins in his own body upon a, on a tree, that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Anybody ever see that movie called The Passion of Christ put up by uh, Mel Gibson? It'll bring tears to your eyes. To realize what Christ went through. And you know, I don't believe he even come close to showing us what Christ really went through. If you really take a good look at the scriptures and know the history of the Roman Empire at that time, I don't believe he, he touched upon it. I cannot imagine being whipped the way Jesus was beaten. The Jews didn't whip him. The Romans did. Jews had a law that you can only beat him 40 times, say one, 39 times. That's it. And if you went over, guess who's next? But the Roman Empire, they didn't care. They did it for the pleasure. They loved it. They, they whipped him until all the skin was hanging off of him. Then you throw a robe over it. You ever do that? Cut yourself, you put something on, and you, you know, try to cover it up, and then you go to yank it off and, and it starts bleeding again. <laughs> Hurts. Can you imagine the pain of having a rope stuck on your back, making fun of, spat up on, putting a thorn, a crown of thorns put up on your head, <coughs> and then have it ripped off after it dried? He did that for us. So that we would not be lost forever. Truth regarding the death of Christ. In 
in Hebrew, the fifth chapter, and verse 9. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. The death of Christ would only be meaningful if I only accepted the benefits that have been given to us through obedience. In Matthew, the seventh chapter, and verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What did he say? If I don't submit myself to the will of God, I lost my soul. I put Christ's death in vain. I'm stepping upon Christ and saying, it wasn't worth it. You died, I don't care. You know, I think about that, that accident that happened down in Oklahoma. They said that was the most solemn group of people that ever seen enter into a football stadium to watch a game. They gave a moment of silence for, to remember those who lost those lives in that accident. The very Chuck brought out in the adult Bible study, we think about 7-11. And how many people turn themselves over to God and, and pray for those who lost their loved ones. But you know, sometimes we sit back and we think about it now, it's been years later, and a lot of people just don't care. And when we become disobedient to God's will, that's what we're saying. I don't care. I don't care Christ died for me. Not important enough. If I'm lost, Jesus Christ did die in vain. Did he die in vain for you? If you're not a member of the body of Christ, you got the opportunity to do something about it before it's eternally too late for your soul. You must hear his word, you must believe that he came and lived upon this earth and was perfect, died upon that cross, and was resurrected, resurrected. But you must be willing also to repent of your sins. I'm not going to live for Christ or for God. Excuse me. Thinking ahead of myself. I'm not going to live for myself any longer. I'm going to live for Christ and for God. That's repentance. I'm going to do a complete turnaround. I'm going to do the opposite of what I've been doing for years. You must confess that He can confess us before His fathers according to the book of Acts. Must be baptized in accordance with Romans 6, chapter, verses 3 and 4. We were baptized, buried with him in a watery grave, rose up a new creature. We become the sons of God when we rise up out of that water. We become his children. Christ died meaningly. But meaningful. We understand why he died for me. 
so that I can be able to spend eternity with him, have redemption of my sins, forgiveness. But sometimes we do trip, we do fall, we do make mistakes, and we need to repent, make it right with God. Because Revelation, second chapter, verse 10, talks that we need to be faithful until death. And sometimes we do the first part, and it's easy. That last step, I don't care what age, to try to remain faithful is difficult. I'll be, I'll be upfront and honest. It's a struggle at times because we go through problems that we don't think, think we're going to encounter or count on. Somebody told me I should never have said that I might walk out that door and take a heart attack. Well, guess what? I never thought of that. But you never know. You think those people are expected to be hit down in Oklahoma while watching parade? They didn't know. We don't know. Could be some drunk come up this hill if we leave this building and hit us head on and kill us. Are we prepared for heaven? Or have we made Christ's death in vain? We need to do something about it before it's eternally too late for our soul. And you need to be serious. We need to think about it. Are you prepared for heaven? Am I ready to die? And will I be with Christ and God forever? You think about these things. You do something before it's eternally too late. As we stand and sing the song, an invitation. <laughs>